complex is not random. Now, complex systems can be high dimensional and random like, but they are not actually random. More often than not, they're chaotic. So, however, there tends to be a little bit of randomness in real world applications, I should mention that. And so, what does it mean to be complex but not random? So complex data comes from complex systems. A process or dynamical system is complex if it has many degrees of freedom, it's high dimensional, chaotic and regular variables interacting nonlinearly, an underlying topology, a structure that spans multiple scales, and the ability to produce emergent behaviors. Interactions on one scale that produce complex phenomena on another. Now, chaotic and emergent behavior, these are not ideas related to randomness. So what do we mean exactly by chaos? Because that sure sounds random, don't you think? Chaos is not random. Chaos refers to a process with three important features. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Periodic behaviors are ubiquitous but unstable. And given any outcome, all other outcomes are still expected to occur, at least eventually. Now this last one is called topological transitivity, and I'll explain it in a little more detail later. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions is pretty easy to understand, and that's what was discovered in 1961 by Edward Lorentz. Working on a model of atmospheric dynamics, he decided to repeat a previous run, but he wanted to start in the middle. So he restarted after the, previous, the original run, but he had a printout, so not all the digits were printed out, and so he didn't have as much accuracy in his restart as he did in his original. And what he saw was that even though the new run started out close to the original, very soon they were completely different. This was sensitive dependence on initial conditions. He worked and worked, took a couple of years to figure out what happened. Of course, first assumed his computer had a bad vacuum tube. Eventually isolated the phenomena into three equations. And so these Lorentz equations are is a system of three differential equations which he created strictly to capture what happened when he saw this sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And what he saw was what's known as the Lorentz attractor. So this is the butterfly. You've probably seen it. I'm going to rotate it here in three dimensions. Uh, it, the tractor looks very complicated. Uh, in fact, it's chaotic. Now, if this is a, a ex intentional example, intentional capturing what it means to be chaotic, then let's see what we mean when we say the word chaotic. So first off, sensitive dependence on initial conditions is fairly straightforward. I've got a point here moving on the Lorentz attractor, uh, but it's actually 10 points all very close together. And notice that even though they stay very close together for a little while, they soon begin to separate. And once they begin to separate, as they're about to start doing here, they really separate. I mean, they get to where they're doing things that have no relationship to the others. So now you can see they're all moving on the uh, Lorentz attractor. I think there's only five of them. I may have said ten. But you can see the sense of dependence on initial conditions. They are all seem to be moving independently now, like they completely forgot that they all started out together. Now, the Lorentz attractor is what's known as a homoclinic tangle. The trajectories are attracted to the point zero, zero, zero. In other words, that's really where they want to go. But they can't go there because as they try to go there, they get shifted away uh, from zero, zero, zero. And there are infinitely many ways of approaching the zero, zero, zero point, 
So every time they attempt to dive down to zero, 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 they get kicked back up into the Lorenz attractor where they have to run around for a little while before they try to dive back down towards the zero, zero, zero point again. So this is the sensitive dependent on initial conditions because as they dive down, they're going to go right or left. Notice once they've decided if they're going to go right or left that they really are fairly predictable. So you've got this uh, spiraling out from an unstable equilibrium on the right and a spiraling out from an unstable equilibrium on the left. But eventually they spiral out far enough that they get close enough that they can dive back down towards zero, zero, zero. And then each one of these points is going to make a decision about where they want to go, to the right or to the left. Now, of course, they don't make a decision, but it's very sensitive to how they approach zero, zero, zero as to whether or not they go to the right or to the left. So should be pretty soon here. They should be pretty close to the dive. Eh, they're getting there. I think one more time around and these points will all dive toward zero, zero, zero. So there you see them dive. So those two went to the left from my vantage point. Uh, and then they curled all around. Now they're over there on the right. Here comes some more diving down. Um, but they're going to go toward, as they dive, they're going to shun away toward the the right. And you see the Lorenz attractor coming from this decision, this uh, series of decisions uh, on whether or not to go right or left as they dive down toward the... Now, Poincaré is the one who discovered this concept of homoclinic tangles and who really laid the foundation for the study of chaos between 1887 and 1912. And these homoclinic tangles are caused by homoclinic saddle points. For instance, 0, 0, 0 in the Lorentz attractor. So, as we saw, the trajectory repeatedly returns to points close to, but not the same as, the point it started at because it's really trying to go to zero, 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 but it gets repelled away. And so these homoclinic orbits imply folding, much like taffy folding into itself repeatedly. Now, whether a trajectory dives towards zero, zero, zero and goes either right or left, that's not random. That's completely determined by the system of three differential equations. So if we were to take a plane a horizontal plane and intersect it with the Lorentz attractor, then what we should see is a capture a, uh, a picture of diving down toward the zero, zero, zero and the Lorentz attractor. So if X is a point in the intersection of the attractor with the plane, and then the intersection of the attractor with the plane is what's known as the Poincaré section, then its return map is the next intersection. So if x is there, r of x is the next time it comes back down into this intersection. Now, the Poincaré section of the Lorentz attractor, notice trajectories here don't intersect. And notice that the section is not a set of solid curves. It's just a set of points. Uh, the points that you get when these curves go around and plunge through uh, the plane. So this is what the Lorentz attractor looks like. It has these four pieces, and uh, these aren't solid curves. As a matter of fact, they're fractals. If you were to zoom in, you would actually see canter sets. You would see that the actual shape looks like you've got a bunch of removals. Uh, and you can see why the removals, because you've got holes, and the holes lead to holes, lead to holes, so on and so forth. Now there's another attractor, which is very similar, called the Rossler attractor. We'll just look at this because it's fun to look at. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, these three differential equations. Only one of the equations is nonlinear, the other two are linear with these parameter values. And so the Rossler attractor, what happens is if you start near the point at equilibrium, 
then you've got points that are spiraling out from this unstable equilibrium and over time they spiral out but they can't go to infinity so what they have to do is they have to go up in the air and fold back down into the plane. They're not quite in the plane but you can see this folding process of homoclinic tangles is very well illustrated by this Rossler attractor. The Poincaré section is fairly interesting because the Poincaré section is almost one-dimensional. So that means it's almost just a, a typical Cantor set that we saw earlier as an example. So the return map for the, Cant uh, the Rossler attractor is if you've got an X then I'll do that again so we go around and where we hit the next time that's R of X that defines the return map now if chaos was random and by that I mean identically independently uniform distributed then the return map would look like this so given an X the value of R of X would be random and it would look like just uh, like somebody took a sand and poured it uniformly on some kind of a square grid. But the Rossler uh, return map doesn't look anything like that. In fact, the return map for the re Poincaré section of the Rossler tractor looks almost like a parabola. Even though it's a Cantor set, it's not a continuous curve, but it has this para parabolic arc look to it. So, let's go back to complex data from complex systems. We've looked at chaos and we've looked at uh, many degrees of freedom, chaos. Uh, now we've seen this multiple scales strange attractor behavior and now let's talk about emergence. Now emergence means interaction across scales that can produce new behavior not associated with a single scale small-scale activities implying large-scale outcomes. For example, genotype implying phenotype. A locally simple process it has to be a nonlinear one, but it leads to globally complex outcomes. And so emergent behavior in a nutshell is simple processes plus multiple scales equals complex system. For example, let's look at proteins. Proteins are made up of somewhere between 100 to 1,000 amino acids. Amino acid is 10 or so atoms with three position coordinates and three velocity coordinates. It's a non-random, non-linear dynamical system of somewhere between 6,000 and 60,000 differential equations. And proteins fold into complex structures. And so protein-related data tends to be big data because we're sampling from a high-dimensional complex system. So here is a protein at equilibrium. Nothing you see in this image is random. This is actually a disease-causing protein that is being modeled using what's called a molecular dynamic simulation, uh, which is a combination of chemistry, biology, mathematics, and computer science, all those working together to help us produce this. But there's nothing random there at all. Nothing you're looking at is random. Everything is exactly the way it's ordained to be. So proteomic data is big data. So for instance, if you had an antibiotic, how would it work? Well, it would be ingested at, a, ingested at a human level, absorbed by bacterium at a cellular level, cause changes in a protein shape or function by interacting with amino acid side chains via chemical reactions at the atomic level. And if you're going to study that process, where do you have to collect the data? At the atomic level. Even though the answer is on a scale 10 to the 10th times bigger than where the data has to be collected. So complex systems and big data. To study emergence, we have to have data sets large enough to reflect multiple scales, high volume, enough variety to allow emergent behaviors high variety, algorithms fast enough to produce answers, high velocity, and big data has information that can't be expressed as an equation involving regular variables. That's why we tend to use algorithms.